a very kind introduction. Oh. My pleasure. Sorry, I just got to get out of this one second. Uh-oh. We can see you moving. We can see the slides moving. Okay, I just, okay. I just got, uh, sorry, I just got to get rid of my screen. I got uh, the recording thing. Okay, hang on. Here we go. All right, there we are. Thanks so much, Nadia. Thank you uh, to all, all the students for uh, taking part in this today as well. Um, I hope that I can shed a little bit of light on what landscape architecture is, I guess, to us, our staff, our firm. Uh, as Nadia mentioned, uh, I did spend uh, time at Guelph and abroad. And I'm, what I'd, I'd like to do today is actually just go over a short uh, biography of who I am and how I got here. Uh, we'll talk a little about uh, scope of work. We'll look at some of the more interesting projects we're working on, then I'm happy to take on some Q&A at the end. So in having said that, uh, I'm originally from Hamilton. I don't know if any of the students are or not, but uh, been there pretty much my entire life. Uh, offices in Burlington, and I currently live in Etobicoke. Um, I've always believed Hamilton is just a diamond in the rough. Uh, it's starting to come when I was a kid, all the steel plants were pumping away. And uh, now you can see from these images, the waterfront, uh, it's being developed. Uh, the steel plants are closing and being, I guess, uh, refurbished into other uses as well, uh, namely housing, parks, marinas. So I, I think uh, Hamilton is uh, definitely an up and comer. Uh, back in the 80s, I did my uh, BLA at Guelph. In fact, just before we started, I was telling Nadia that uh, back when I was in school, it was a five-year program versus a four, and they only took one class a year. It was like 26 students, and then we basically graduated with about 22-ish. We lost a couple along the way. So, uh, yeah, the classes now, I'm just astonished how big they are. But uh, anyway, it also speaks to the fact on how popular landscape architecture has become and where it is going as well. Uh, all of you are entering this industry uh, at a perfect time. Uh, COVID has actually helped propel our industry forward. Uh, perhaps some other industries uh, it has uh, knocked down, but certainly in terms of landscape, sustainability, uh, climate resilience, these are all issues that we're dealing with. And some of these weren't even around when we were in school. So by the time you graduate, there may be new uh, areas that uh, have to be considered. While uh, my time at Guelph, as I said, it was a five-year program. Um, I did, towards the end of it, start to get, uh, bored isn't the word, but uh, I'm not a big winter fan. And, uh, you know, things were getting somewhat easy to get through uh, the program. So I wanted to challenge myself. And I thought a good way would be to uh, spend a year at another institution and um, just test myself. Uh, and so I applied to a couple of schools. Uh, coincidence, they were all in the sunny states. Uh, I just I didn't want to see winter for a year. And I ended up at Cal Poly uh, at Pomona out in California. And they have a school of environmental design there, which uh, I have to share with all of you. There is not enough money in the world that I could trade for the experience I got in that one year. Uh, the level of experience, the teaching that I received there, uh, the camaraderie from the professors there was second to none. And it's largely because of what happened there that I'm happy to pay forward my time and experience with students today. Um, they were very, very generous with their time and expertise and, uh, I'm the winner for that. And now I pass that along to uh, staff and students as well. Um, upon graduation from Guelph, uh, an opportunity came up to do a little bit of teaching at Humber College and I helped rewrite the program there. 
Um, no teaching experience. It was just something I, I wanted to do, I love to do. And as it happens, I'm teaching their senior class uh, right now on Thursdays. So at the end, I'm going to share with you some of the reading material that I've given them uh, that I think you would benefit from as well. Um, as Nadia mentioned, an opportunity came up to uh, do some work with HGTV. Uh, this is long before there was an HGTV. Um, it goes back many, many years. Uh, the OALA and Landscape Ontario were trying to help uh, a TV producer put together a show called Garden Architecture for this uh, new network that would be coming out that hadn't been licensed yet called HGTV. Um, long story short, uh, it ended up, I ended, I ended up hosting this thing for five season <clears throat> and I brought in all of my colleagues, landscape architects, designers, anybody that I could, I wanted them to be a part of this too. Uh, so I, I think uh, it was funny enough, uh, you can uh, download it off Amazon now, but uh, anyway, I was much younger, thinner, had hair, it was black back then. Anyway, it, it was a lot of fun, something that I had absolutely no business doing, I had no experience in it, but uh, it just goes to show you if you, if you are passionate about what you do, uh, the possibilities are limitless. Uh, they, they will come knocking at your door. And speaking of which, on the heels of the success of that show, which started in Canada, moved to the States, and then uh, I had friends from uh, China and Japan uh, emailing me, telling me that I'm watching you on TV. Your mouth is moving, but you're speaking Mandarin. So anyway, we, we had some fun with that too, but that led to getting a call from McGraw-Hill Publishing out of New York and asking me if I was interested in perhaps putting a book together, which led to uh, this 200-page book uh, called Hardscaping. Uh, again, I had no business doing it. I have no experience with it, but took it on. It was a lot of fun. And again, it leads to other paths. In 92, I opened up uh, my own practice, Safarian Design Group, uh, made up basically of me uh, initially, but then it grew to including landscape architects, landscape designers, and then has grown as well to where we are today, which we'll get to. Part of what we did recently with our staff, we got some professional coaching and uh, we needed to create a mission statement for the company. Um, initially, I didn't really see a need for it, but the, the more serious you get about your work, uh, you really need to have some direction. So when a client asks you why you are in landscape architecture, or why do you want to become a landscape architect, uh, you should be able to have a solid answer for them. And th this takes some thought. This sentence here didn't happen very quickly. It took weeks and weeks uh, of uh, kind of, of evolution to finally get to this point. So if somebody asks you why you're in this business, uh, the answer is not for the money, okay? Uh, it has to be something much more uh, larger than that, much more spiritual than that. So in any event, that's uh, our mission statement. Uh, we call landscape architecture a superpower. Um, we've gone on to win a number of uh, local awards, national awards, and you can see some international awards too. We continue to enter our projects. Uh, we're doing quite well in that area. It, it, it's fun. Uh, staff get a good kick out of it as well that we could enter something here on the other side of the world and get, uh, uh, get viewed for it as being something uh, very substantial and win an award for it. Um, our company is on a number of different social media platforms, as you can see. I encourage you, if you haven't, to go on some of these things. We have our own YouTube channel as well. Of course, our website, too, uh, you can go to. Not, not only our firm, but any of any landscape architectural firms in Ontario, you should be reviewing. Before I applied to uh, BLA in Guelph, uh, I knew nothing about landscape architecture. One of the things I did, and again, I'm dating myself here, but there was no cell phones, there was no internet, no computers. 
there was a big thick uh, phone book that we dealt with. And in the yellow pages, I looked up landscape architects, called up these companies, and I went and visited three of them. Uh, just said, you know, could you spare me half an hour and just explain what landscape architecture is? Explain to me what it is that you do. I'm thinking of getting into it. And again, I think I contacted 10 firms and three were excited about chatting with me. Um, and those three made a huge impact on me still today that they shared their time, the principles of the firm shared their time, their experience, and made me get even more excited about landscape architecture. So our company is broken down into basically three divisions. Um, myself and two others, uh, Brad Smith, who is also uh, a graduate from uh, Guelph. We also have uh, Mike Flint with us now, who's also a Guelph graduate. Uh, but we've kind of broken down the three areas into the, the different scope of work that we do. And within that scope of work, uh, we basically follow what the staff, what their passions are. My personal passion when I first got into landscape was residential. It went from doing, you know, Mrs. Jones gardens to doing uh, larger estates and estate planning and multi-year construction projects. Um, staff helped the company develop some of these other areas like parks and open space planning and design, ecological design and rehabilitation, active transportation and trail development, recreation, sports and leisure, community commercial design, school grounds, greening, and residential design is, as I said, where I began. And we've also now included 3D modeling and animation. So not all of these areas are areas that I touch on a day-to-day -day basis, but my staff do. It is areas that they love. Uh, that, that they're very passionate about. So I'd be a fool not to pursue projects in those fields. I want to retain these smart individuals that are here right now. In order to do that, yes, they're going to work on some of my projects, but I want them to excel in what excites them. And over the course of the next couple of years, each and every one of you will have to decide, you know, what is it about the industry that really turns my crank that excites me? Uh, and that'll help you decide where you go from here. So let's look at some of the projects that uh, we, we, we've worked on. Um, let's turn the sound down there. So this is, if anyone's from Hamilton, you'll certainly recognize Gage Park, uh, a very large park uh, down in the East End. And this was the overall design of this was done by Howard Dunnington Grubb and his wife back at the turn of the previous century. Uh, so there's a lot of history here. And this one particular area had been run down. The water wasn't working. The fountain had fallen apart. So we basically took on the redesign and reconstruction of what you're seeing here. And I should mention that all of these, all of this photography and drone footage that you're seeing, uh, we, we do here in the office. It's all in-house as well. We've trained our staff to do this work. So we try to do everything ourselves. But uh, in putting this together, there was a lot of work involved in dealing with the city, dealing with the friends of Gage Park. There was the friends of the Grubs. Like there was a whole series of people that required uh, some uh, coaching on where we were going with this. And we wanted to stay true to the initial design, given who did it and how long it's been here. So I, I, don't, I certainly don't take credit for the design of this. Uh, that goes to Grub, but uh, I think we helped rehabilitate it back to where uh, maybe it was initially intended. Um, you can see that we use a lot of 3D and animation as well. Uh, that's, I find that very helpful in what, uh, how we sell our work as well, not only to uh, council, but to neighborhoods too. For anyone out in the Oakville area, this is Hickson Park. 
uh, was just built last year. The finishing touches are still going in the ground as we speak. In fact, uh, it was beginning of this week, the lighting finally went in, albeit it's buried under snow, but it's a little parquet built around a dozen homes. And uh, in consultation with the town of Oakville, uh, this design was created and built. You can see how uh, a 2D drawing may be difficult for some to understand. Uh, and in, in the case of everybody here in this class today, I would say you've got to get over that hurdle if you haven't already. But when you're dealing with the public, this type of imagery is what we find sells. Of course, there's different ways of presenting it. This was just uh, the one way. Uh, but certainly, as I said, come springtime, it'll be done and open for use. Um, some of the trail work we've done, if uh, any of you might be from the Cayuga or Haldimand area, there is the Grand River there. And uh, we were hired a few years back to create a trail system. Uh, you can see on the drawing here that uh, looped around both sides of the Grand River. And in the top area there, there is an old railway track uh, that was derelict. And so part of what we were asked to do was to convert this railway track into, a tr into the trail system, the overall trail system. So we had our concept together, brought it into 3D, sold the idea, did all the construction drawings, and then built the work. So this, you can see from the video here, going through the different stages through concept and design, and then followed by construction. There's a composite decking that we used here. And we made these two of these lookout points that you see now. So people could still have proper circulation, but they could also uh, sit and take in the views as well. Interesting project. You can see that piece of machinery in the middle there where the lookout is. Um, this thing was very narrow. So when that machine who was hauling all the material, when he went on that bridge, uh, he, there was no way of turning around. He could only go forwards and backwards. So interesting process, interesting set of uh, issues that we had to deal with on this project. Thought it came out very successful. People started using it right away. And it became that connection from one side of the Grand River to the other. So people finally had access across. Uh, we do a lot of master planning work as well. This site here is uh, the headquarters of Landscape Ontario out in Milton for anyone out there. Uh, you'll find this at uh, the 401 and 5th line and I guess James Snow Parkway on the other side. So they wanted to create a international destination. And so everything that's green and paved here is part of an overall master plan that we put together. It has been being phased in over a number of years. Uh, first couple of phases are in. Uh, the next phase, we actually have a meeting this Friday. We're presenting the next phase of drawings to the board. And uh, with any luck, it will go out for uh, tender in April and get constructed this year. Uh, part of the intention was is to be open to the public, to have the grounds where people can come in and see different uh, types of landscape. Uh, part of it is also to create areas where members can come and build uh, display gardens, so albeit contractors or designers or landscape architects. And then also was created to bring schools and children to the site so that they can learn uh, what landscape architecture is all about and uh, design, albeit good, bad construction techniques. Um, you can see here coming up to kind of those hedged areas would be display gardens for members to build uh, their gardens that they can bring their clients to and show off. 
parking. Uh, there was parking for about a couple hundred cars. Uh, on the west side of the property, there is a storm water pond. This is the west side here. So uh, a neighboring site, a storm water pond was put in and generally those things that uh, we can take advantage of as views, water, trees, we can plant that up. We're looking at the arboretum that we created to the north side of the building. And then on the east, east side, this is uh, uh, the wet, existing wetlands area. Uh, generally, it becomes a no-touch zone that we can't do anything. But what we can do and what we have done is in the wintertime, if you put helical piles into the ground, then you can create these boardwalks that walk through the wetlands. And we can start to educate people to the importance of these spaces and why we can't touch them. For everybody out in Guelph, uh, this park is downtown Guelph, Miko Valeriate Park. Uh, it's encased uh, on backyards on all four sides, a strange kind of uh, encapsulated site. And you can see here some of, I included some of our conceptual sketches on how we get to a final design. And there you go from concept to final uh, drawing and through to construction now. So this has been there for two years now, I believe. So it's built, but some of the construction shots of how we went from uh, kind of what looks like scribbles on a page to final uh, construction shots now. And you can see from the perimeter, all these houses backed onto it. Uh, the park did not face any street. Uh, so if you were lucky enough to live in this enclave here, this became your backyard. Again, done in consultation with uh, the city, the parks department and council there, talking with the neighbors on what they want in their space. And this was the final product that led us to uh, this site. This is an interesting project. This is one that I've been involved with for, it's, I think we started this seven years ago. So this is down in Niagara on the lake. And what you see here at the top of your screen within that red dotted line is the pillar and post in and spa. And what you see Below it is what was the parking for the pillar and in the more so in the bottom right in that kind of no man dead area that used to be the old CNC yacht facility where they made yachts uh, well, a hundred some odd years ago. Um, so when we were first approached by the owners of uh, the site here and uh, he's a self-made billionaire uh, from Asia. Um, at the time, he started collecting original Monets around the world uh, for his private collection. And he came to us asking us if we could create a Monet-inspired garden in this space. And we said, well, absolutely, it's just time and money, really. Um, but as we got into it, we really got excited about it. So you can see John Street in the middle. So everything below John Street, you're looking at about six acres below John. All of this was part of the overall design. We didn't touch any of the uh, existing pillar and post on the top half. So what we did was we started, of course, to research who Monet was, what he did, how he lived, his home in Giverny. Uh, and through that, we were able to create uh, a master plan that you can see here. And this master plan, we had to get buy-in from the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, we had to get buy-in from city council. And I should say this was the largest project at the time that they had jumped into. So they were a little nervous about it. Um, we went through a number of uh, public meetings to get input to make sure everybody would be happy where we were going with this. Uh, so some of the things we incorporated into this site was uh, obviously the gardens and there's a full story behind how we arrived at 
the final design here. Uh, it's all that's actually a lecture in and of itself. But suffice it to say, everything you see here is Monet inspired uh, from his home in Giverny and his work. Um, it is walled in. If you look at the perimeter in the background, uh, you'll see a large brick wall. So this is uh, a gated park. It is open to the public uh, most of the time. It's not available to the public when they rent it out. And if you know anything about the Pillar and Post, you know they rent it out for uh, uh, weddings, for banquets, for functions, for corporate events. So you can rent out these spaces, in which case they uh, gate the park. And when uh, it's not being rented, it's open to the public. And in fact, you can go there now. Uh, they have a portable skating rink set up on uh, the large uh, lawn area that we created. So you can actually go skate there, have a hot chocolate, uh, and take in the winter scene for these gardens. You know, a lot of these gardens, uh, the spaces were broken down into uh, multi-user events. So you could have a 300 person wedding in one part of this uh, garden and on the other side have a smaller 10 person event, a 20 person event, a 100 person event. You could have multi uh, functions going on simultaneously. Uh, it was a great deal of time and effort that went into the design of this. You can see from the trees that we're looking at, uh, the, obviously we're looking at mature state here. And as we were building the project, uh, this was a multi-million dollar project, uh, which is now done, by the way, it was just completed last year. Um, a year and a half ago, uh, the client flew in to do an inspection and his first comment was, uh, you know, wonderful, uh, where's all the big trees? And at that point instructed us to bring in some much, much larger mature trees. And on that note, I thought we've got this on our YouTube channel as well, but I thought it's worthy of showing you how we brought in this one tree. We found it in Oakville. Um, you saw how big that ball was and that crane that we're looking at now is a hundred ton crane. The tree is just over 60 feet tall. Okay, so you're looking at 20 plus meters and to get it from Oakville to wow, Niagara on the lake, it took uh, almost 10 hours because the size of that ball you saw right there and the branches would not fit under the bridges along the QEW. So I think there were nine bridges we had to go around. So the truck left at two in the morning to avoid traffic. And every time we came up against bridges, had to go off, take the service road, and then get back on the highway again. Uh, you can see this tree being put in place, and I'm glad we captured this. You can see the park coming together there. But I'm glad we captured this because where the tree sits now, we tell people what we're telling you now, that we brought this tree in, and they don't believe us. They're saying there's no way you could have. And we then point them at our YouTube channel to watch this little video. So there you can see the whole park coming into play, the whole gardens. And you see kind of how massive this thing is. I should tell you as well, uh, it, it's well worth watching these things. Not only what we're seeing now, but how these things are dug. That tree was, that ball was hand dug. That's not a machine spade. It's truly an art how that comes together. And there it is going into the hole and they'll eventually backfill and uh, take off all the ropes. Again, you see from the 3D uh, design we had in the previous slide, uh, some of the, uh, the ideas coming into fruition here. I don't know if I'm allowed to share with you what that tree cost, but uh, let's say that it was a down payment on a house. Uh, 
Um, getting into some more uh, plaza type developments. Uh, if anybody is out from the Cambridge area, this is downtown Queen Square. There's the restoration of the waterworks that were there. So what you're seeing now was initially there, the, at least the mechanics of it there, but nothing was working properly. So we were hired to take on this project, landscape the uh, site as well. And you can see here getting into the concept in 3D. And this is the actual shot of it installed. So 3D in this case was essential. We had to go through council and the BIA and the neighborhood downtown to get everybody's approval on this. They all wanted to see what we were doing. And again, 2D drawings don't completely show everything for everyone. So we had to create this type of imagery and uh, animation so everyone would have an opportunity to comment, yes, we like it, no, we don't, what about this? Uh, and through this process, one of the comments that came back to us was, what about uh, in the evening? What's this going to look, at, look like in, at nighttime? So in the animation, we actually created a, a nighttime vision of this too, so people could see how the night lighting uh, would affect the site and uh, the safety of those within it. You can see here now going into the evening. Again, all of this uh, droning and photography was all done through uh, our office here. That's something that has become a staple of what we do as well. Just, it certainly shows off the work in a much greater view. So if you're out in Cambridge, uh, feel free to go out there and have a look. Uh, I think you'd be happy with the results of this, especially in the spring, summer, fall months. So as I said, uh, my expertise kind of came in initially from uh, the residential area. So I thought we should touch on some residential work a little bit. This is out in Norfolk County, a uh, large estate that uh, we designed. It's a century home. And everything you see here is work that we've done. Uh, there was about three years of construction that went into this project. Again, multi-million dollar landscape project. Uh, I think this was one of the biggest pools I've ever done. It was 30 feet by 60 feet. Um, so some of the conceptual work that we started with, uh, the house had a beautiful, uh, it was all Credit Valley stone. So trying to lay over some of our concept drawings over the uh, site too, so you can see the relationship, how it works, how it all comes together. I should note that we will be going back in the spring one last time. Uh, we left the driveway as asphalt and we'll be lifting that and putting stone down this coming spring. For those of us uh, who are familiar with the water down area, there's the water down uh, skate park and outdoor skating rink that uh, we worked on. Um, it's adjacent to another skate park, which is the skateboard park that we did for the city many, many years ago. And we've done an overall master plan for this area as well with soccer fields, baseball diamonds, etc. This one uh, was built in conjunction with the architects and the building that you see here. Uh, and it is being widely used as we speak right now. There's the Zamboni at the top right. We're starting to see more and more of these uh, uh, in uh, many different uh, municipalities. These are becoming very popular, especially since COVID when people are somewhat housebound. They're looking for ways to get out of the house, looking for things to do. Uh, and this seems to be a very popular uh, amenity that's being created now. Back to Hamilton again. Uh, I throw this one in because the city of Hamilton hired us to do this lookout that you see here. So I don't know that I would have considered it landscape architecture, 
But given where the lookout was and it cantilevered out over the escarpment and the escarpment itself, it was hard to say no to this, uh, even though we weren't planting trees and shrubs. Look at what we had to work with. Um, absolutely incredible. In the middle of your screen, you'll see the lookout. It cantilevers out over the escarpment there. That was the project. Uh, so it was predominantly driven by engineers and all the calculations that had to be done. You can see a Shadok golf course down at the bottom of the escarpment there and the waterfall just to the left of uh, the outlook. Um, this came off, it, it, it looks simple. Let me tell you, it was not simple, uh, but very successful, it gets a lot of use. And we were just awarded the next phase of this to create another lookout for the city of Hamilton as well, for Albion Falls as well. So we are just getting working on these drawings now. And uh, just kind of the last larger project, I'm kind of going from small to large projects. This one is out in Waterloo, um, right across from the rim building that you see there. So if you're familiar with downtown Waterloo, oops, at all, um, you'll be familiar with Silver uh, Laurel Creek and Silver Lake. This is what you're looking at. It's been dredged here. It's in the process of being dredged. Construction is well into uh, way. It should be completed by the end of this coming year. But if you can imagine the scale of this site, what you're looking at, and then this is what is currently going into that site. Contractors have been there for a year and a half now. And this is what we're working towards. There's that lake that uh, you just saw that was dredged. And so it's going to be a large beachfront. There'll be waterworks, splash pads, playgrounds, trails, hiking areas, lots of horticultural uh, planting, trees and shrubs. And then of course, uh, the night shot as well. So this is currently going in the ground. This is one of the larger pro projects that uh, we've got going right now. And one of the longest uh, ones as well. Um, very quickly, just jumping back to some 3D animation work. Uh, this is uh, out in Bobby Point in uh, Etobicoke, a site. Uh, throw this in just so you can see why we do these 3D and animations. It's something that uh, may interest you to get involved in. But if you were to look at this site, it's difficult to try and explain the grades with this on a 2D drawing, especially to a client who may or may not understand uh, you know, stairs go up and down uh, on a flat piece of paper. So this type of uh, animation or rendering really helps uh, to get the understanding of this, uh, the design through to the clients. And lastly here, this is a project, it's a huge estate um, out in the bridal path in Toronto. It has not been built. Uh, it made it to this point. And I put it in here to show you, A, not every project gets built, but that doesn't mean you put any less effort into it. Uh, a great deal of effort was went, went into designing this space. And you can see how large it is. It was intended when uh, for the clients who entertain, they'll have about 200 people there at any given time. So there's you know a lot of amenities we needed to work into the space as well. This is where you dream. You get to have fun. You know, formal gardens, informal gardens. You know, tennis courts, activities. Uh, many, many, many different spaces that uh, people can sit, take in, and enjoy either in small groups, medium-sized groups, or large groups. Okay, so if I had to kind of sum up everything we do, uh, or landscape design, this would certainly be a good statement to, for you to understand, a good understanding of the design elements, principles, and form composition. You'll be getting into this very shortly. If you haven't yet, these are the tools you need. Um, and along with your creativity. If you have that, you can go anywhere in the world and practice. Uh, when I was out in California, out at Cal Poly, as I said, uh, I 
ran out of uh, money real quick there. So I had to uh, start working uh, illegally just to help uh, myself survive. And I remember I went to a nursery there and I explained my situation and the nursery owner agreed that he'd pay me cash to work there evenings, weekends. And he said, well, you're already a student of landscape design. Why don't you start doing some designs for me? And I remember almost shrugging him off, laughing, saying, no, 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 I'm still a student. I don't really know much about design. I really don't know anything about the plant palette that you have here on the West Coast. And he proceeded to laugh and educate me. And the statement that you see on the screen in front of you is what I took away from that. He taught me that I didn't need to know the names of the plants. I needed to understand the design elements and principles that led into form composition, that led into plant hierarchy. So I could on paper design, well, I want a tree here, I want a shrub here, I want ground cover here. And then by explaining to somebody who does know the plants, well, what kind of tree do you want? Do you want a vase shaped tree? You want a large canopy tree? What color do you want it to flower? Do you want it to fruit? Um, do you want this to have good fall winter color? Like if you can start answering those questions, describe it, then that person initially said, well, there's only three or four trees that I would recommend in those categories. He started showing me pictures of these trees and I immediately pointed, that's the tree that I see in my head for this site. And then we'd go through the whole process with plants. And he made me realize I didn't need to know the names of all the plants to be a good designer. So in any event, you're, it, as I said, if you haven't already, you will be learning about these things. But when they're presented to you from Nadia and uh, the rest of the staff there, make sure you absorb every bit of it and understand it because that along with the design process will be the fundamentals that you need to become a good designer down the road. And I thought since we're in January right now, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, Landscape Ontario, uh, every year they have their awards of excellence. And as it happens, uh, it is tomorrow evening. It is online and I'm gonna give you a link that you can go watch some of these projects, past winners. Uh, you can see what uh, the winners for 2021 would be. And they cover everything from residential to parks, to commercial, to institution. They'll do maintenance and nursery. Uh, you'll see some really interesting projects, some pretty incredible work. This is concrete, but I think it's some of the best concrete work I've ever seen. Um, the different types of settings. You may learn some new technology. You know, we are also now, look at the furniture in here. That's part of our scope now, right? The fire, everything that you see here is now part of what a landscape architect does. So you'll get some different ideas. You'll get uh, learn some different creativity uh, in, in some of this work. And of course, you'll recognize this one I showed you earlier. Um, so you might want to jot down loawards.com. Tomorrow, 6 o'clock, log on. Well, they've got a reception at 530. It's all virtual. It's free for you. Uh, it'll take about an hour, hour and a half. But, uh, you know, even if you have dinner in front of your screen or the TV, I'd say it's well worth uh, sitting in and seeing some great, great work. Uh, I give a lot of talks throughout uh, Canada and the United States, and I can tell you that the work you will see tomorrow is far and above some of the stuff we're seeing across the country and especially in the States. I think we're at least five years ahead of the States right now for the most part. Um, I mentioned earlier, and I'm just going to uh, round things up here. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching a senior class at Humber College right now, and uh, some of the books that I'm recommending to them, I know Nadia has given you a reading list, but and these books may be on that list as well, but if they aren't, you might consider uh, getting these. Uh, you know, I know we're in the digital age, but I'm still a firm believer in, uh, you know, having uh, hardcover books that you can flip through and refer back to. I find it a little easier, but uh, to each their own. But certainly this book by Grant Reed, 
from concept to form and landscape design. If you're interested in residential uh, work, I think this is the Bible in that, uh, Booth and Hiss, Residential Landscape Architecture. I should say all these books you can get used on Amazon too, sometimes for five, ten dollars. Um, Woody Plants, I'm sure you'll be taking uh, that course in the coming years. Michael Durr has made the Bible in that respect. Um, planting design, residential landscape design, plants in the landscape. Uh, and of course, we've got uh, Thomas Wang, who pencil sketching, plan and section drawing. He has always been the master in that genre. And then finally, we can just wrap it up with this, you know, I love this saying from our uh, friend Albert here, a true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm open to...